And we are going to move on to our next project, uh, which is um, Aileen, uh, Andrew, Joe, and Sarah, uh, who talked to their project was Pandemic Learning, a video series. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Um, to get started with introductions for our group, uh, my name is Aileen Twyer. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and my service site is the Roseville Library. My name is Andrew Everett. My pronouns are he, him, and I uh, serve at Metro East Career Pathways. My name is Joe Ramlett. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I serve at Interfaith Outreach and Community Partners. My name is Sarah Atkinson. I work at Gap School over in West St. Paul, and I use she, her, hers. And as Joel introduced, we are the Pandemic Learning Video Series group. Um, we created a video series documenting pandemic learning. Um, really, the inspiration for this project was how important education um, and schools are in our communities and how they're really at the heart of our communities. And we saw COVID-19 and the move to distance learning as an opportunity to move forward um, to address technology inequities in school. Um, we decided to make a documentary in order to tell the story. Um, we really wanted to include research data as well as personal experiences and really aimed um, to try to interview researchers, administrators, teachers, parents, and students themselves. And so as Sarah just mentioned, we reached out to a variety of different groups. Um, two of the groups that we ended up working with on a, on a constant basis. Uh, one is the University of Minnesota Learning Technologies Media Lab, uh, which provided us with research, which will be talked about in a minute, um, and lots of information about the shift to pandemic learning, um, as well as St. Paul Neighborhood Network, not only as the host for CTEP, but also as providing us with training and equipment for actually recording, filming, um, and producing the videos. So special thanks to both of those organizations. So when we were ready to start our interview process, we sent out a ton of emails to a wide variety of potential interviewees. Uh, like Sarah said, we wanted to get the full picture. So we were hoping to interview teachers, administrators, students, parents. Uh, fortunately, the first people to get back to us were these researchers from the University of Minnesota Learning Lab. And they were really on the cutting edge of thought about emergency learning, about distance learning, online learning. And so talking to them gave us a really strong foundation uh, and kind of helped us build that background knowledge to do the interviews. We were hoping to move from there and work our way towards uh, speaking with people who were less enfranchised, uh, people like victims of the digital divide, uh, marginalized people who uh, we could offer our documentary as a platform to share uh, the stories of people who really struggled to meet the technology requirements or get access to internet to succeed in uh, distance learning. What ended up happening was the people who were, you know, most happy to speak with us were often people who were actually pretty well equipped to handle uh, online and distance learning. Uh, we spoke with uh, an administrator who his school actually already was one-to-one -one with tech integration. They had, every student had access to a laptop or tablet even before the pandemic started, which is very unusual. Uh, and we spoke to a teacher who was so comfortable with online learning that he was hoping to continue uh, working online as much as possible, uh, even as in, in person, uh, class is resuming. So uh, we got some really great interviews with these people, but it also did mean that our representation of the pandemic was a bit skewed towards people who are actually uh, well equipped to handle it. And I, and I think it makes sense that those were the people who were most eager to speak with us. Um, but yeah, it did mean that we didn't get the, the full wide picture we had hoped to uh, represent how the pandemic learning went. 
then yeah, I can speak a little bit about how production went. Um, it was a really unique experience trying to film during a pandemic. And I think we, a combination of hard work and a little bit of luck, uh, managed to pull it off. So we started interviews kind of winter, early spring. Um, and doing that safely, we managed to get space in the SBN studio, uh, which is big enough that we could go in as a crew and stay masked and stay distanced. Uh, and film our interviews and let our interviewee kind of be able to sit comfortably and unmasked to give their interview. Um, and so that was, I think I had experienced filming interviews before, but that was new for me. Um, and then also new for me was Zoom interviews. That was kind of something we, you know, had to do for either safety or because a participant kind of couldn't get into the studio, um, conducted some interviews over Zoom. So that was also a learning experience about kind of what the technology, already technological challenges of Zoom, but then when you're actually trying to record for, you know, really good video quality, what does that mean? Um, so we learned a lot there. And then kind of as the year went on and we kept doing interviews by kind of the early summer, we did our last interview with um, a teacher. At that point, most of us had been vaccinated. So we were able to actually go to the school to interview the teacher um, outside on the football field and still feel safe. And that was really nice to kind of actually be able to go and do kind of a more traditional interview on location. Uh, and then kind of along with the challenges of filming, we also kind of had some challenges in post-production. So our original goal was to create a short documentary um, with our interviews, but kind of what ended up happening is we had really great footage of the interviews, but not much else. Traditionally, you'd be capturing something called B-roll, so kind of supplemental, you know, visually interesting footage to pair with the interviews. And we just didn't have a way to capture that safely uh, with the pandemic going on. And so kind of, we still wanted to use the footage we had. So we uh, changed our plans and ended up editing our interviews together into a video series. So we would pair kind of similar conversations across interviews together into kind of um, different topics for each video. And those are gonna be going up on the SPN website sometime soon. So uh, check out the website if you're gonna wanna see them. Um, and here is a sneak preview at our website that will be going up to SPNN. Our website, like Aileen said, will be split into the themes that arose during interviews. And this video um, is going to be, um, this is the video that focused on transitions to online learning during March 2020 last year. Enjoy. I mean, thinking back of the timeline, I think we had heard about the virus in January and February. It was still unclear what it meant, how serious it was. Um, I remember being in schools. We were doing professional development with teachers that had nothing to do with online learning. And they were talking about this thing that was happening. You know, should we stock up on toilet paper? Is this going to be real? And the way it was situated at first is that we would be online for like two weeks. And so we were kind of getting ready for that. I don't think anybody really thought from the beginning that we would be online for the rest of uh, the school year. In March of 2020 is when the state of Minnesota shut K-12 schools down. What that looked like was sheer panic. And it looked like, like all day, all night working into the weekends and all hands on deck. Uh, I received notification that the governor was going to announce the next day that schools were going to be closed. So. With the indication that the governor was going to make that announcement, I reached out to what I call my collaborative learning team. That's about 75 people throughout the district. And what that really means is it's every decision maker in the district. And so I reached out to them, uh, asked them to meet at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Uh, we worked for 16 hours that day. I worked that throughout the night to make sure that I had lots of good food and drink for everyone at the district office. We spread out. Everyone had comfortable clothes, and when I had made the announcement that we needed to meet, I said, get comfortable and be ready for a long day. And my team jumped right in. I couldn't be more proud of their work. And so our teams uh, dug right in. They did an amazing job, and we were able to communicate uh, that evening to families uh, what was going to be happening in our district, and our, our parents and our families did a great job in working with, with us on that. One of the things that, that I, I get really excited to talk about is like really how 
when everybody's all interested and invested in like kind of learning this one thing towards a common goal of the shift to online, um, it's amazing like how fast that happened. It's something like that that would have taken us probably in a regular year, like a three year rollout to, to do a pilot program, um, to find some other teachers who were interested, uh, to you know, kind of talk a group of people into or see if there was interest in um, doing something like, you know, like Google Classroom across the middle school. Um, that would be a three year rollout if we were to do something like that in a regular year versus like a two week, the state is shut down for two weeks and by next Tuesday, we would like everybody's, you know, here, here's what we did agreed on as a building uh, to have in our courses online. Um, if, if you need help, here's where to get it. The shift that happened though, that eight workday window, it was insane. So if you, anytime you move a class online, that takes several months. So if you think about that scale, one class, and then you think about the scale, what our state did when it shifted K-12, all distance, emergency crisis teaching, that shift was um, almost impossible. So I find it really magical what happened um, in the moment of crisis, what K-12 uh, districts and schools did. what K-12 uh, districts and schools did. I mean, thinking, I mean, thinking back of There we go. Thank you all for coming. And yeah, I think time for questions as well. All right. So yeah, anybody can put comments or questions into the chat. I think this, this project was a great example of, like for anyone that either participated in these projects last year or viewed these. You know, there were so many projects last year that had to completely pivot their own civic engagement projects halfway through, like dramatically different to what they thought their projects were gonna be at the beginning where they were like in-person camps with lots of kids over the summer and like all of a sudden we can't do that. So, I mean, I think this project was a great example of like how much this year our project could accomplish kind of knowing what we were getting ourselves into a little bit more with the pandemic and really be able to focus a project from the beginning on something um, that they could really kind of carry through through the whole year. Um, yeah, so we've got a question from uh, Virginia. I'd love to know what you all learned during the process. That's a great question. I'm happy to jump in and maybe others can follow up. I think um, I think the last part where Cassie, one of the researchers in that video was talking about how kind of magical it was to be able to shift um, to emergency remote teaching online for the entire state and just the magnitude of that work, um, I think really speaks to, again, the inspiration for the project and how important education and schools are in our lives and in our community. I mean, hopefully that by showing that as well as other topics, um, talking about how, you know, the, the concept of learning loss um, where students are learning over time and then forget things such as over the summer or during remote teaching or things like that. Um, by putting these out on the SPNN website, hopefully we'll be able to really engage not only the educational organizations that we originally reached out to, uh, but community members as well for just reminding everyone how important schools are and really appreciating and, and garnering respect for um, schools and teachers and educational staff, academic technologists, paraprofessionals, um, administrators, because I think we saw last spring for like a month, everyone, teachers were, you know, teachers, nurses, frontline workers, um, everyone was a hero. And I think that we have kind of forgotten that. Um, and so hopefully this will shine a little bit of a light on that. Yeah, and then I'll jump in also something I learned um, in talking with the researchers. They were really clear that there's a difference between online learning and what was happening during the pandemic, which they called emergency remote teaching. 
and they wanted us to like, really understand that emergency re remote teaching happens in crisis that this isn't kind of normal online learning which might exist you know already existed um, as an option for a lot of students um, to kind of find online learning that's like really developed and really thought out curriculum and processes and that what was happening kind of all over during the pandemic was not online learning and they hope people don't kind of get those two things confused and that they really were kind of pushing for um, time and acknowledgement that we did kind of live through and work through a crisis and that students and families and teachers um, and everyone kind of involved in this needed you know grace and needed time to process um, and that kind of we really need to understand that this you know we, we got through it kind of extraordinarily but that this was a crisis and that this was really hard for everybody oh yeah like right. uh, Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, I mean, Andrew, why don't you give some comments and then we'll uh, we'll move on to the next project after you finish up. Sure. I, I was just going to say uh, that uh, related to what Aileen was saying, um, it was interesting to start to get a glimpse into the, the networks of people who are invested in the future of online education or just uh, in general, like tech administrators and learning about the, the communication they were having and how people who were in those networks uh, were, uh, yeah, having these conversations about best practices for handling things and uh, their hopes for uh, where this would go during the pandemic and also their hopes for, uh, like uh, one of the interviews was saying, uh, teachers did mobilize quickly to learn new t uh, approaches to technology and education uh, due, due to COVID. And so it was interesting to become aware of like how that network was working during the pandemic pandemic and where they hope uh, things could go from there. All right, thank you so much.